everybody, and thanks for coming. It's actually a great turnout. Um, I think I know most of you. For those that don't know me, I am Professor Puchowski here in the Department of Fire Protection Engineering. Um, and we're delighted to have uh, with us today Dan Madrakowski um, from UL's uh, Fire Safety Research Institute. Uh, Dan will talk more about that. Um, topic of lithium ion batteries. Um, becoming, um, I think, more and more relevant in terms of, of fire safety and just our society in general as we see more batteries. Um, so just in terms of a brief introduction to Dan, and I'll let Dan talk a bit more about um, his background, but I've known Dan, uh, I think we met in 1993 uh, when I first started with the NFPA. Um, and the story behind that is, uh, so I've known Dan for a lot of years. Um, I think our careers have sort of interwoven in and out. I thought I see him a lot. Um, but especially for those of you that are just starting out, um, build your relationships, uh, make contacts, network. And I know uh, I'm a little bit older than you guys, so how you do that is much different, I think, as you deal uh, with this electronically uh, and through your social media things, which I really have no idea what that is. I barely have a LinkedIn account, and that's about all I do. Um, still largely email and text, uh, but I encourage you all to uh, to uh, continue to develop your relationships and build your networks, because um, you never know um, when you can do somebody else a favor or they can help you out and um, how that might impact your career uh, moving forward. Okay, so with that, Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Milosh. So I started my career <clears throat> in the 80s as a co-op, and uh, that got me interested in fire. I was uh, a co-op student at the uh, National Bureau of Standards, which turned into the National Institute of Standards in 1986 um, in their fire research division. I spent 32 years there, um, found that the funding for fire research was better outside of the government, even though some of the money was coming from the government. Interestingly enough, it didn't seem like the government wanted to give it to its employees. It wanted to hand it out to other, other places. <laughs> So we went to other places, and um, UL has been a great support um, for fire research. We've um, one of my uh, missions for being here is to find people. Um, we're growing pretty rapidly. Seven years ago, there were four engineers, uh, including myself, and uh, now I've got more than thirty people on my team. So um, uh, we're getting great support from UL with regard to. Uh, doing a lot of different research work. <clears throat> so to brief introduction, let me turn that on and that'll work better. What is UL? Uh, many of you may, well, we all know UL just by UL, but it's really three different companies. Uh, there's the research institutes that I work for. Uh, they're a charity, they're a not-for-profit group, and they get funded by money that's generated by UL Solutions which is the for-profit group. So if you're looking at the stickers and the approvals and the certifications and the listing, that all comes from them. Um, there's a third group, which is also a not-for-profit, which is UL Standards and Engagement. So they uh, hold the performance-based standards that UL Solution uses to test with and work between UL Solutions and the research institutes to help develop new standards. Um, and they're developing a lot of standards for lithium ion battery powered devices right now. So our institute started as the Firefighter Safety Research Institute about 10 years ago. And um, Underwriters Laboratory says you're doing a great job with the fire service, just take over all fire safety. And so they modified our name. So we still do a tremendous amount of work with the fire service because anytime there's a fire, they're gonna be called to show up. So they've gotta know how to deal with it. And we try to help them deal with it in the most effective and efficient manner and safe manner that they can. An overview of some of our key research areas. The QR code will take you to our website if you wanna see videos or more information on some of these. But firefighting tactics is one of our mainstays. Uh, assisting with fire investigation techniques or the science behind fire investigation. Uh, better understanding of fire dynamics, for example. Material science, I'll show you a little bit, a little video about that. We've been uh, developing a uh, material properties database that's available to the public. We've been, since the past two years, been engaged in wildland urban interface fire spread, basically building to building as opposed to wildland fuels to the building. It's more like once one building gets going, how do we slow that down? How do we stop it? We currently have a team in Maui that is a 
doing an investigation requested by the state um, on the timeline of that incident and, and how things unfolded in that incident. Fire-related chemical exposures. This is both for civilians as well as firefighters. What are people getting exposed to when there's a fire, when there's a wildland urban interface fire, and people are getting exposed to the smoke for weeks on end? What does that mean for their long-term health? Uh, for firefighters, if they get exposed to uh, components, we're going to measure uh, working with WPI here in just uh, a couple of weeks uh, with the Boston, working with the Boston Fire Department. Um, if fire service gets exposed to uh, the uh, combustion products and effluents from uh, EV fire, what are they being exposed to? Are they being exposed to vaporized metals? Uh, HF, what kind of chemicals are they coming in contact with? How do they need to be protected? Or if they're appropriately protected, what do they need in order to decontaminate their gear? And of course, this leads us to the mitigation of battery fire hazards. <clears throat> so one of the tenets of the research work that we've been doing for the fire service for the past 15 or 20 years is that today's fire environment has changed. And this has been going on for more than 50 years, well before all of you were born. <clears throat> there was a day, uh, the late 1950s, some of the 60s, maybe a little bit of the 70s, where houses were made with solid pieces of wood and um, the furniture in the houses were made of natural materials, typically cotton. Cotton doesn't hold its shape very well, so the, the cushions had steel springs in them, had a solid wood frame. And honestly, they didn't burn all that well. They smoldered, they made toxic gas, they were still harmful. They could still generate a flashover, but not like what we see today. <clears throat> Where we live today, uh, if you go back to your apartment, your home, uh, you'll find evidence of foam plastics everywhere, uh, under the carpet, uh, in, in your mattress, uh, in your sofas. And foam plastics are great. They're hypoallergenic in many cases. They hold their shape so you don't need the steel springs anymore. Uh, the challenge is once they get lit on fire, they have about per mass, uh, based on the heat of combustion, they've got one and a half to two times the amount of energy that they can give off when they burn compared to the cotton. And they'll give off that energy given the kind of polymer that they're built with. They unzip very quickly when exposed to heat. They'll give off that energy very quick. Also, they need more than 21% oxygen to burn efficiently. So anytime you light a piece of polyurethane foam, even a small piece with a match, immediately you'll see black soot coming off an indication of inefficient combustion, right? Because it would like need 30% oxygen to burn clean. So you're gonna have this inefficient toxic gas coming out. It's a nasty deal. <clears throat> we changed how we want our houses to be. And so we're using uh, engineered lumber to achieve what we want in our house, an open plan design. So we're now, instead of 12 to 14 feet between load bearing walls. Now we can be 40 feet between load bearing walls or more if we have the trust to support it. This changes where the fire, how the fire can spread. There's less compartmentation, things like that. Also, there's more air stored in the closed house that's now pretty weather tight to let the fire get bigger just based on the air that's in the house. So I'll show you an example here where we went out and bought furnishings uh, on the natural side that were made of cotton. Uh, we have a hardwood floor in that room. We have a wool uh, carpet in that room. The curtains and the blanket that you see burning are also made of cotton. On the synthetic side, uh, we have a polyester blanket, polyester curtains. We have a foam that has polyurethane foam seat cushions, polyester batting in the back cushions, and polyester microfiber on the cover, polyolefin um, materials in the carpeting. And you'll notice there's a big difference in the fire development, the amount of smoke that's generated, and we'll see the time for that smoke to ignite and generate a flashover condition. So the big difference here is that the synthetic materials have a higher heat of combustion or a higher energy density, right? <clears throat> More energy available to be released during a fire per pound than we have on the natural side. So what that did was basically make fire growth faster, right? So we went from conditions where when the fire department would respond to grandma's house, uh, the fire may not have been as developed by the time they got there. Or if it was developed, it wasn't as responsive to additional air. 
Once we get a ventilation limited fire with the synthetic fuels, there's a tremendous amount of unburned fuel in that house. And so uh, vents are made in an uncoordinated manner, letting more air in. It needs more air to burn and uh, the fire will get worse before it gets better. And in many cases, that kind of uncoordinated fire attack has resulted in the loss of life of firefighters. So you could see that the older fire, the natural furnishings, if you will, they were more forgiving in a way. It took longer for the fire to develop. They weren't as responsive to additional air. They would respond, but it might take minutes instead of potentially seconds. So what does that have to do with lithium ion batteries? Well, in the event, we're effectively seeing another case where now with lithium ion batteries, we're bringing something into our homes that has a higher energy density, right? The amount of energy per pound in a lithium ion battery is much higher, trying to sort of make it equal than a polyurethane foam, for example, right? Clearly, why are we going to lithium ion batteries? Because the energy density per pound compared to a lead acid battery or a uh, NICAD battery is much higher. So <clears throat> think about, we can do an exercise, you guys are students, right? Think about how many lithium ion battery powered devices you have. You got your phone, laptop, anybody got a scooter at home? Scooters. Anybody ride a rented scooter? Anybody got an EV? Power tools? Things like that. I mean, most folks when they start, you know, as they're in life and they have a house and they look at all the things they have, they typically have like 30 different devices that have lithium ion batteries in them right now. And if everybody's using them every day, we know what are the what are the three leading causes of fire? What are they teaching you here at WPI? Who knows? Men, women, and children are the three leading causes of fire. So basically, if you have stuff out there being used, um, people are going to abuse it. It's going to get misused. It's going to get damaged. And despite a, as good a job as the engineers might do to try to foresee that and try to protect against that, you know, we've had situations, again, you're a little too young, but about 10 years ago, uh, if you're boarding a plane, there were certain phones that they would make an announcement, you cannot bring your phone on the plane because they had a record of bursting into flames due to poor battery control. Uh, for a while there, there were laptops that were a few of them bursting into flame. Again, battery management systems, engineers have overcome those, I would think. The frequency of those have gone down. But now we're in this uh, area where things like scooters that are not being tested by anyone and are just being imported um, are having some challenges. Some of them may be with the original design, which we'll talk about, and some of them may be due to people modifying them or just how they're being used or perhaps abused. Where do we find lithium ion battery fires? Well, we can find them anywhere. So this May uh, in Illinois, <clears throat> it was springtime. They had just plowed the fields and they had a windy day. And the dirt from the fields went over I-55 and created enough visibility problem that there was a multi-vehicle uh, pileup. 70 vehicles were involved. Six people died. And two vehicles in that out of the 70 burned. One was a fuel tanker, and one was a tractor trailer that was loaded with uh, batteries, lithium-ion batteries for power tools. So we're seeing them everywhere. So lithium ion batteries are very similar to other batteries in that there's a cathode and anode. They have an electrolyte and they have to have some kind of separation uh, basically to allow that uh, electrolyte or to allow the charge to move back and forth between the cathode and the anode, but still prevent a short circuit. Well, what's different with the lithium ion batteries? Well, the cathode is flammable. The separator is typically a type of plastic that can also burn and uh, the electrolyte can burn as well. So we have this challenge called thermal runaway and uh, <clears throat> basically the battery is storing electricity as, chemi as chemi uh, chemical reaction basically to convert it back and whenever you have that chemical reaction there's some thermal generation and that causes the temperature of the battery to increase. If it continues to increase that increases the rate of the chemical reaction and it just gets into the cycle where it will go to either uh, blow a uh, overpressure vent and just release gas, or it might explode, or it might catch fire. 
Uh, part of that depends on the state of charge of the battery. If you're interested in seeing a lot of different batteries uh, going to thermal runaway and how they're uh, forced into thermal runaway by maybe a puncture or physical damage or overcharging or whatnot, I encourage you to take that course. Uh, that course is led by Adam Bowery. He's one of your uh, WPI alumni here. And it takes about 45 minutes, but it's a great background uh, class in uh, lithium ion batteries. So here's an example of what you might see in the course. So we're going to put a battery cell, small cell, in an oven. And on the left-hand side, it's only charged to 30% state of charge. So what that means is it's not storing as much energy as it could. And we see that we heat it up. It goes into thermal runaway and smokes and glows. And honestly, it's not really that exciting. So now let's take it to 100% state of charge and see if it performs any differently. So now there's more energy stored in it, right? So we got sparks, we got a little bit of an overpressure, and we've got some flame. So that's, that's cool. So when you get a lithium ion battery device, what do you have to do right away? You've got to charge it because they're not, they're not shipping them 100% charge. Uh, shipping companies like to see them at 30% or less. And you can see obviously why. So we saw that it gives off some smoke. Um, what kind of smoke is it giving off? And even though we call them all sort of lithium ion batteries, they do have different battery chemistries. And uh, so nickel, cobalt, and aluminum here on the left, you see that we get about 30% uh, hydrogen coming off. We have about 15% unburned hydrocarbons that, are, that can be coming off, uh, 26, 27% of CO and the remainder carbon dioxide, CO2. Now, if we go to the lithium iron phosphate type battery, notice that now we have almost 50% of the gas coming out of that battery is hydrogen. And you've probably seen on YouTube somewhere the Hindenburg, right? Landing, blowing up, uh, full hydrogen, a hydrogen blimp. Um, Milash, I'm getting scared. Nobody, knows, nobody remembers the Hindenburg. What's the Hindenburg then? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just Google it, you'll see a neat video. Um, uh, hydrocarbons again, about 20%, less amount of CO and uh, a lesser amount of CO2. So again, these chemistries continue to change both in uh, the technologies we're seeing in our phones as well as what we're seeing in EVs. And again, I guess the goal right now is to try to get to a solid state lithium ion battery, maybe in five to 10 years that would reduce some of this fire potential. So another thing we see going on, and I, I saw a great place for one of these just across the street from our hotel here, a couple blocks over next to the power grid, um, are these battery energy storage systems. And what utilities are using them for is whether they have uh, solar power that they're collecting or if they're just banking power that they're generating. For low periods, they store it in lithium ion batteries and then they can use it later when there's a high demand. So again, the full technical report is, uh, you can get a link to it there. I'm going to go through this kind of quick. Um, these energy storage systems, they basically look like c tainers with a lot of uh, HVAC on them. Uh, they're filled with batteries. So you can see there are racks and racks of battery modules. There are 14 modules vertically per rack. And there's uh, 28 lithium ion uh, pouch cells per module. Altogether, there's over 10,000 batteries in one of these battery energy storage systems. They've got um, eight HVAC units, and they're trying to keep the temperature in there at about 75 degrees. Uh, lithium ion batteries are very sensitive to temperature. So like in your uh, the electric vehicle, the manufacturers are trying to keep the battery temperature between 68F and 86F. If the batteries get up to about 120, 122, they should shut down and stop doing anything to try to minimize the chance for going into thermal runaway. Have any of you ever left your um, cell phone on the dashboard on a sunny day and then picked it up to use it and it says, I'm too hot? Same kind of thing going on there. <clears throat> so the utilities and their contractors are monitoring these things. And um, we can see that at uh, just before 5 o'clock in the afternoon, um, it was noticed that the 
battery cell voltage in rack 15 of this energy storage system in Surprise, Arizona was decreasing. Not, that's not right. A few seconds later, they have these uh, very well instrumented. They noticed that the air temperature measurements were starting to increase. This triggered their, uh, their VESDA smoke detector, um, went to alarm condition. And so in theory, that then disconnected the battery energy storage system from the grid. The air temperatures peaked at 121.6. Well, that's relevant to them because they want to keep it below, certainly below 120. And then shortly thereafter, so this is all happening basically within 90 seconds of first noticing a variation in, in voltage, uh, their suppression system discharged. <clears throat> Notice that they didn't call the fire department. They're still monitoring. They don't really think this is a problem. They're still in contact with the unit. They're just trying to figure out maybe we need to send somebody out there. So again, this is like at uh, five minutes before five. About an hour later, uh, some civilians call the Phoenix Fire Department, Phoenix Metro Dispatch, and uh, these departments around the Metro of Phoenix get discharged, and they're called for a smell, a bad smell, and some smoke near an electric substation. And their thought is that um, this is a brush fire. And so a few minutes later, the utility loses all communication uh, they notice the temperature is continuing to go up. So this is the ESS system that's kind of in a remote area. That's why they initially thought it was a brush fire. Fortunately, the first responders got there and they noticed a white vapor on the ground, so they called hazmat. And they were doing all the right things and time is marching on. They're not letting anybody from the utility in. They want to go in and hook up to a computer in there so they can figure out what's going on. They've got this white vapor coming across the ground. The fire department's running around with sensors and uh, thermal imagers, I shouldn't say running around there, surveying the area, the hot zone. And um, they're doing it over and over again, and they're not making entry into the building. And as you can see, the hours are clicking on, and they're following a strategy, right? They're following a, a flow path decision tree, basically. Uh, do we still have? Uh, bad things going on in the hot zone. Do we see evidence of uh, heat generation in the, in the structure? Or are we measuring gases that are coming out of the structure? If not, then do we declare the hot zone safe? And now maybe we can make entry and check for fire. So the visible gas and vapor mixture was no longer being produced. Um, the hazmat team pulled a hose line and they're getting ready to open the door. And uh, you see here that, remember, this started around 5 o'clock. And so we're several hours into this event. Uh, they open the door, and uh, <clears throat> they have a six gas meter. And they're monitoring it. It overranges, so they're not making entry. They reset it. They monitor again. They reset it about the third time. And before they got a, another reading, they had an explosion. And uh, two of the firefighters were blown through that uh, chain link fence and ended up 75 feet away from the structure uh, on fire. So a lot of energy coming out of that explosion. So as a result of that, there's been a number of NFPA code changes uh, for signage on these buildings and uh, fire, different kinds of fire control systems and monitoring systems and things like that on the building. And this is what's going on next. So we're worried about the fire service interaction. There's a fundamental the hazard that comes out of lithium ion batteries when they go in the thermal runaway. Regardless of where the batteries are being installed, that could be in a micromobility device, that could be an electric vehicle. There's a transition towards energy storage systems. There's a lot of benefits to them. This particular scenario, it could be an energy storage system on the wall releasing flammable gas. It's the same gas hazard. So we're looking at the fundamentals of the hazard and less on the particulars of the battery technology. What we're finding so far is that there are some requirements for safety in the codes, and some of those are good, but there are some gaps that we need to address. Batteries can release some flammable gas, and the amount that they can release could potentially create an explosion hazard. So we're trying to develop some data here to reevaluate the amount that's safe to release and to understand how much gas will be released before you represent an explosion hazard that could harm the occupants or injure a firefighter during a size up at an incident. So these experiments were run a year ago in September, 
And we thought we were kind of ahead of the curve. We were working with the IFF, we're working with the Department of Energy, and trying to understand the hazard here and provide some guidelines to the fire service. Well, basically, before we can get the report out, we had a real incident uh, in Colorado. In this particular case, it wasn't a uh, battery energy storage system on the wall. It was a hybrid vehicle that was in the garage. Uh, the residents reported that they had smoke in the garage, maybe a fire in the garage. The firefighters made entry through the house. Uh, I guess it wasn't clearly communicated. It was a garage initially. They referred to being downstairs. But basically, this garage had to go down like three or four stairs to get into it. So they took the line in the front door, <clears throat> they brought it around to the garage, and what they saw was a, a Jeep there full of smoke, and it had a glow in the back seat. And um, so they opened the door. And when they opened the door, uh, it resulted in an explosion that blew the door off and narrowly missed this firefighter here. He ducked his head very quickly and just got his helmet knocked off. So I'll show you a, a video in real time uh, comparing one of our tests to this incident. So things are changing rapidly. I mentioned to you earlier that when we went from synthetic fuels to uh, foam plastic fuels in our homes and even the transition to um, engineered lumber, that took decades. Um, with micro mobility devices, our first experience was with hoverboards. And in 2012, we didn't have any in the United States unless somebody made one in their garage. Uh, by 2015, we had two and a half million. Now that number, I'm sure, is even higher. And what we found from some of the early challenges for people that got these for Christmas and they plugged them in uh, was not only did it create a fire, but it also helped to spread the fire uh, by shooting lithium, burning lithium ion battery cells around. So we want to make sure what we do in the lab mimics real world, so we look to YouTube. And here we have a young man that's got a scooter in the house plugged in and charging. Um, the battery's gone into thermal runaway. His attempt at suppression is not good. <laughs> so if suppression doesn't work, you've got to vent. So he's going to vent next. I mean, interesting decisions here. He's not leaving the house. He's just going to open the door. So needless to say, this probably won't end very well. And New York City has had a tremendous uh, amount of fires just in the, that have grown uh, in number in the past three or four years and have been lethal. Uh, I don't know if you saw the YouTube video of this one, but <clears throat> the particular fire here in the image was a little more than a year ago. And uh, uh, was a family's apartment and they were either working on scooters or charging other people's scooters as a side gig. Uh, they refer to them as juicers. Well, they'll get a uh, Lime Scooter, one of the other commercial scooter companies, they get an app on their phone and uh, collect scooters at night, charge them up in their apartment, and then redistribute them on the street the next morning and get paid for charging. So there was a, uh, a fire broke out. They had a lot of scooters in that apartment. And if you look closely, um, you can see just to the left of the fire that there's two people. The two teenagers in the family were on sort of a drain pipe, and they're crawling out of that, uh, out of the fire. Uh, and fortunately made it down to the ground. Uh, their mom died in the fire and their dad was severely injured. It's not just New York, many other cities are having similar problems. So in New York, this was as of June 3rd, um, we could sort of see the trend that in 2019 they had 30 fires that were the result of lithium ion batteries. And then by 2021, it was 104. Uh, 2022, it was 220. And this year they're on track uh, to exceed the 220. Uh, as of last month, the number of deaths attributed to lithium ion batteries this year has increased to 14 people. Um, so, this is a, a big challenge. This is 
an extraordinary amount of damage um, from this single bike that you can see here to my left. This call came in around 10.41 a.m. this morning. We are still here fighting this fire. We have over 50 units, fire and EMS on scene. We have over 200 members. Our response time was less than four minutes. We quickly stretched the hose line into the building and started to extinguish the fire. The amount of fire that is produced by a single battery in just under five minutes was we were unable to get ahead of it. It had spread quickly into the void spaces of the building and took off from there. It was a difficult operation. We quickly um, went to a defensive operation. You see these tower ladders. We stopped the fire from spreading to the furniture store, but the fire had already spread to the laundry mat. There is extraordinary damage. This entire building behind me is completely destroyed. The roof is caved in. There is nothing left. Um, and it is all because of this one single bike. And so we really want to emphasize to the public how much damage can be done by a single bike. But I think that this shows how really dangerous this is to our members, to the public. The e-bike uh, fire, it's, it's so much force behind it so quickly. Like I said, under five minutes, we already were putting water on that e-bike fire and it had already spread throughout the building. It's really a uh, something that we have never seen before as far as um, a small fire turning into something like this in a matter of a few minutes. So again, this idea that the fire growth rates, the fire spread rates are getting faster. How do they know all this? Well, we can look at the videotape. A uh, store employee brought his e-scooter in and plugged it in the stock room uh, to charge it up while he was on shift and it caught fire. He tries to get it out of the building, but he's not successful. And from there, basically, it burnt down the entire grocery store and uh, the laundromat next door before the fire department could uh, intervene and stop it. So what are these e-scooter batteries? Uh, well, the first thing I want to make sure that you see is that there is no UL logo on that battery anywhere at all. <laughs> uh, so these are batteries that you're, uh, can be imported into the United States. Uh, you can buy on any online shopping service, and uh, because of the cost of them, they're not required to be tested or checked by anyone due to import law. Um, so the batteries consist of 136 cells. <clears throat> this is how they're wired. So eight parallel circuits, 17 in series, is a 20 amp hour, 60 volt battery. Um, as you can see, the battery container is you know less than a foot tall, about eight inches wide or so. Um, and what we found when we bought 10, 12 of these and took them apart is that they're all very different. Uh, three of them were mislabeled in terms of how they were wired. Uh, typically, the amount of wiring is different. You see a lot of extra wiring, red wiring up there in one image. Sometimes it's just a couple inches of wire. That's all that's really needed, different color wires and whatnot. These are being, not being made in a factory at quali under quality controlled conditions. These are being assembled by hand somewhere. And uh, the battery uh, management system is what we see in the uh, image on the uh, upper right here. This is the circuit board. That circuit board is basically double sticky tape to the top of the batteries. This battery is sort of shrink wrap like you have for uh, a pack of soda, something like that. And then it's slid into a steel box. There's quarter inch thick foam tape on the sides and top of the steel box. The steel box gets a top screw down on it. It's got a handle on it. You put it under the seat of the scooter. There's no restraining system in the scooters that they sell. No bungee cords, no straps, nothing. It just sits there and bounces along as you ride. So you can imagine several potholes perhaps, maybe hundreds of potholes, who knows, but it's pretty likely that that battery management system, if it worked initially, could get damaged. And uh, and then that's where you have the challenges with overcharging or um, discharging too fast can also lead to thermal runaway. So this is in the uh, uh, UL Solutions Lab in Northbrook, Illinois. Um, we've got an e-scooter we're putting in an overcharge. Uh, so what that means is we've taken the battery management system out of play. Uh, we leave the plug in and keep feeding the juice. And after about an hour and 50 minutes, we start to see smoke from a couple of cells that are going into thermal runaway, and then that spreads throughout the pack of cells, and that leads to an explosion.
The heat release rate rapidly, rapidly gets up to about one megawatt per 1,000 kilowatts. So in that particular case, all the batteries that were in that container, for the most part, they've given up their energy now. And so that's why we have a decrease in heat release rate. And basically what we're seeing now is the plastic, foam plastic on the seat, PVC, ABS plastic that make up the bike and the fairings that's burning. And interestingly enough, we'll see that the fire is going to have a second growth as more and more of the surface of those plastics get involved in the fire. And it will actually go back up, spoiler alert, above a, a megawatt. So interestingly enough, these batteries, these uh, scooters are sold all over the world. Uh, in some places, they're... They have been or still are sold with lead acid batteries. So it actually has two places for two batteries in case of uh, using a lead acid battery. Uh, some design challenges with the battery pack <coughs> is that it has a male prong on the uh, top of the battery pack and you plug a female uh, cable into it to, to power your battery. There's no switch on it. So if you were to put your fingers or in between the, uh, the prongs on the battery, it's hot, it's hot all the time. Again, this is just absolutely inappropriate, unsafe design, shouldn't be accepted anywhere. Um, so working with the uh, FDNY, the fire department of the city of New York, they asked us to recreate some uh, scenarios where their people had lost their lives. So we're doing this in a ranch house, but this could be an apartment building them you know, this fire could be on the 12th floor or 48th floor. So there are cases where a lot of people are living together. They don't trust each other, maybe. So the person brings the scooter into their bedroom, their private space to charge it. Within 15 seconds of seeing the smoke, we'll have an explosion. So that overpressure was between 0.2 and 0.3 PSI. It blew out the window and, in fact, blew glass out of the window about 30 feet. And now that we vented the window, we're providing the fire with additional air. So that's going to lead to this compartment now to transition a flashover. So basically in less than a minute after the first smoke was visible from that e-scooter, we flashed over that room. So there's the room. This is a test facility that we use in uh, near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, we've got uh, some bench scale apparatus there as well as these full scale buildings that we, we burn in. We, these buildings are as realistic as we can get them. They have HVAC systems in them. They're insulated. We're using real glass windows, things like that to try to replicate a true house fire as opposed to just a test prop in a lab. And you can see that when the firefighters went in, we had smoke pushing out of the air returns due to, the, again, that overpressure. The other thing we're doing is uh, post-fire. Uh, we're collecting gas and particulate data, again, to see what fire investigators might be exposed to or firefighters might be exposed to during mop-up. That's the battery box. So you can see the top of the battery box <coughs> flipped off and made a space for battery, some of the battery cells to be ejected. Here's another one that uh, sadly has occurred more than once, where the scooter is now parked in front of the front door. And uh, again, if this is in your apartment and it's off the ground, this is your only way out of that apartment, unless you're good and can get on a, a drain pipe. So again, keep an eye on the thermal imaging view. If, if you had a thermal imager, you certainly can see that the scooter's heating up. If you don't, there's really no clue until the uh, smoke starts pouring out and then odor and other things you know, might grab your attention. But between the time that happens and when there's a, uh, a violent event here, it's pretty quick. The hallway view, basically our cameras that are down here looking toward the living room, looking toward the fire room. So we're trying to see how rapidly folks that might be isolated in the bedrooms would get cut off and lose their ability to escape safely. Yeah. 
see yeah. that sort of one or two cells have vented. We're starting to see a little bit of smoke and then more and more cells within that battery module going to thermal runaway. Again, we get the overpressure event. In this particular case, uh, the bedroom on this end uh, had the door open and it blew out that window as well as the windows in the living room. So that initial rapid growth to a megawatt of fire, and that in and of itself is not enough typically to flash over the room, but the fire quickly spreads to the sofa or the bed or whatever else might be in the room. And that will exceed the sort of, based on ventilation, maybe two to three megawatts that you need to uh, flash over that space. So again, just some of the force that we're seeing in terms of things that were pushed out and, and uh, removed from the wall. We, this had a uh, two, this double door, wood door was in the kitchen uh, in place of a slider. And we had a two by four and steel braces behind it. It bent the steel braces and pulled some of the uh, screws out of the hinge. Just some stills from the video where you can see the, the burning debris. Uh, those are pieces of batteries or pieces of wiring that are on fire and being spread across the room. Is the carpet on fire there from that hallway camera? Yeah. <clears throat> so a lot of batteries were ejected on the carpet early on. I'll show you some pictures there where you're seeing that fire. Um, so you see next to the scooter, see there and there. Um, I guess I should do this up here for them. Uh, you can see the batteries ejected there that were burning and lit the carpet on fire right away. Uh, some of the batteries are shot out here as well. And then some are left in the battery box. So hazards for the fire service or anybody dealing with these after the fact. Uh, concern over stranded energy, especially in the battery energy storage systems. Most of those batteries were not involved in the fire. Uh, it took months to safely remove them and ensure that they were de-energized. Uh, if there's cell or material ejection, from a mop-up perspective, you might have a battery that's going into thermal runaway but hasn't activated yet that might get shot under a sofa or under a bed or somewhere. So again, some fire departments are taking a rake and kind of going through the fire room to make sure that they've got these collected. As we saw, you can have a very rapid heat release rate increase, flame jetting or an explosion, and then potential for acid gas exposure or metal particulates. Um, we did some tests a few months ago where we used residential automatic sprinklers and uh, found that uh, at least for a single scooter in a residential setting, an NFPA 13D system did a nice job. It's not, a, it's not going to put out the battery fire, but it will let the battery fire burn itself out in that relatively short period of time and contain it and limit it from spreading. So you can see that that initial flash that came out of the battery was enough to pyrolyze the bed cover and char part of that. But then seconds later, the sprinkler activated and wet the bed down and uh, stopped any, any further uh, pyrolysis or any further thermal degradation. Similarly, we did a scenario where the scooter was in front of the front door in the living room. Uh, this one was pretty exciting for those of you that have been studying sprinkler systems. You know that an NFPA 13D sprinkler system is designed for the operation of two sprinklers. In this particular case, between the kitchen and the living room and the hallway, there were four sprinklers basically exposed to the fire area, and they all activated, and even with that, it uh, managed to capture and control the, uh, the fire damage, even though there's only about nine gallons per minute coming out of the sprinkler in the living room. We found evidence in the sofa where there were uh, batteries and burning material that had gotten into the sofa and, and penetrated down into the cushions about an inch, but the water again kept it from spreading. So that's good news. We're working with NIOSH again to try to better understand what some of the exposures are on turnout gear and uh, what, what we have in the water runoff. And for the firefighters, of course, getting them to, uh, even after a regular fire, just decon in terms of trying to limit uh, cancer exposures and contamination reduction. Our next move 
is uh, looking at EVs. Uh, in a collaborative effort with WPI and the Boston Fire Department, we're gonna be doing that in a couple of weeks to get that started. Uh, we've got a, a larger program that we're gonna be conducting over the next six months in Northbrook, uh, where we'll be burning a lot of number of EVs in the lab. The goal there is try to understand their fire development, uh, try to understand what the exposures are from them while they're burning as well as while they're being extinguished and what's the optimal way to extinguish them. <clears throat> the fire, most of the vehicle manufacturers say just let them burn. There are some scenarios where that may, may not be possible. If you're in a rural area, that's all that's there. You gotta protect the grass and the trees around it. You can stay there for three, four hours, let it burn, do whatever it's gonna do. Uh, if you're in a metropolitan area, if you're in the big dig tunnel, you can't let it burn, right? So you gotta do something with it. So we're looking at different uh, approaches. There have been some firefighters that have attacked these and claimed they've used 20 to 40,000 gallons of water on them. <clears throat> and uh, we believe that's certainly not needed. Uh, we think they're just thinking they need a lot, you know, 250 gallons a minute or more, and they just keep pouring it on there, but it's really not having a good effect. So we're, again, we want to, we're doing some research in that to help understand that. If you want access to the Best information out there about micromobility fires and EVs. Uh, we had a seminar in March <clears throat> and uh, the resource library, the link to that is there. Um, the people that spoke are Captain Hunter Clare. He was uh, one of the firefighters that was blown through the chain link fence in Surprise, Arizona. Thomas Barth from NTSB, he's probably investigated more EV fires than anyone at the moment. And so he gives us some uh, information, anecdotal information there. Adam Bowery again talks a little bit about the science of fire and explosion hazards. Uh, John Cassidy from FDNY, he's with Hazmat. He's been in charge, put in charge of dealing with the e-mobility device. If they have a fire on the 20th floor in an apartment building, they knock down the initial fire. How do they then get the scooter or scooters out of the building safely without having them catch fire? And so that's part of his job. <clears throat> Evan Belcombe is looking at the EV fire challenges, parking garages, parking decks, things like that. Uh, Sean DeCrane, IFF Energy Storage. <coughs> Pardon me. So uh, I've been talking with uh, Milosh and <coughs> we're, we're located right next to the University of Maryland. So we have a pretty good pipeline there. We would like to improve our pipeline with WPI. And uh, since a lot of times it's not practical for the student to come down and work in our office or in our labs, we're looking at things that could be done here uh, to interact with us. So a couple of projects we just talked about a little bit was material and prop product testing. Uh, we have a material products database. Um, some of it might be do some of the testing up here as a third party comparison to see how well it, it compares. Maybe it's running other materials to add to the database. Building the building fire spread modeling. Uh, we're doing some experiments on the impact of HVAC systems on smoke spread and fire development, which could benefit from some modeling. The electrical vehicle fires and of course modeling incidents. What am I talking about when I'm saying modeling incidents? Well, we just don't know everything. <clears throat> and evidence of that is an experiment that we ran uh, this was a strip mall that we were conducting some firefighting tactics experiments in. And we got a fuel load in there, uh, cardboard boxes filled with plastic cups, basically the group A commodity. And uh, we've got them stacked in rows as if it's uh, sort of a dollar store, a dollar tree store, something like that. And we start the fire. And the only ventilation opening right now is this doorway on the front of the building. So our thought was the fire is going to grow, it's not going to have enough oxygen, it's going to choke, and this is going to be sort of our baseline for when we add ventilation to it. It surprised us a little bit. This was a double wide unit, so it had a lot more oxygen in the building itself, and apparently he had had enough oxygen to generate a post flashover condition. <clears throat> you can see the velocity with which the smoke is coming out of the door, 
And for a short period of time, it's going to have all the oxygen it needs in the building, so it doesn't need that front door for an intake vent. It's going to be a unidirectional exhaust flow. It's going to be moving at about 30 miles an hour. It's going to pick up a sheet of jib board here and throw it. We have the jib board down to protect some wires. And you see our data trailer there in the upper video, so you know that we didn't think it was going to shoot out 75 feet from the building. <coughs> then it choked, ran out of oxygen. Then it required the air from the front door as an intake. The heat release rate went down and uh, it was no longer really an issue. But you can see the pressure build up. Again, it was about 30 miles an hour coming out of the door. So these are things that were running the experiments for a completely different reason and something else happens. And that's really not in our bandwidth or our timeline to analyze that now, but those are things that we can use help analyzing. Um, our materials properties database. If you haven't seen it, uh, the web page. It was the start of it was funded through NIJ resources, and uh, this kind of walks you through. We talk about the methodology, um, what instruments we use, what the uncertainties are, how the samples are prepared. A lot of these are micro scale devices, and then we get up to the cone. And ideally, we're trying to put pieces together so that we can then use all these components to now assemble a, prod a product like a chair and model that and see how close we can come. And then we'll run the chair full scale as well. And so all that data is in there. Again, this stuff's available free to you if you want to use it. Um, so I, I encourage you to, uh, to take a look. So for example, medium density fiber board. That's some of the data that's available for it. The data graphs are interactive. We also have the data in GitHub, so you can download the data sets by themselves. Uh, Craig Weinshank and Mark McKinnon spent uh, a significant amount of time uh, making sure this would work and, and be user friendly. We also, for most of our projects that we do, we have a tech panel of users and stakeholders that we use for advice to make sure that we're getting information that people want. We also have about 30 courses on our Fire Safety Academy. Again, they're kind of oriented toward fire service and fire investigators, but you might find some interesting things there uh, if you want to. And again, they're free 24-7. And uh, that's what I got for you today. So I know I ran a little, maybe a little bit long. We got a couple minutes for questions. <clears throat> Any questions uh, for Dan? So we're hoping that some of you or some of your friends take me locked up on this uh, project, these projects uh, next spring. Yeah, we can do it. All right, so no questions? Chris? Of course I have questions. Sure, I figured somebody <laughs> would. <laughs> Dan, uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, on the 13D sprinkler system in the house, how was the temperature control for evacuation purposes? So we're, we're still, um, we had, we've been doing a lot more uh, chemistry than we've done in the past with regard to looking for, um, instead of just oxygen levels and CO and CO2. So the chemistry data takes a little longer time to turn around. So we're still looking at the uh, tenability. That said, now we've had two instances where this has happened in real, in real life. Uh, one in New Zealand, and I'm trying to remember where the other one was. In both cases, the people that were in the room with the scooter that exploded survived. The sprinkler activated. Uh, they're both, you know, treated for uh, smoke inhalation. In the one case, the guy had some burn injuries as well. Um, so, it, again, what does intimate with the fire mean? But it, it looks like it's it's certainly better. Um, we could we could say that definitively. And then, how much better? How survivable uh, is something that we're still kind of working on? So we didn't get any kind of like odd interaction water and chemistry interaction that we didn't expect dissociation it, or it something. seems that as soon as we have the water on it uh the h the hf threats and things like that seem to go away pretty quickly thank you yes sir uh, thank you for the presentation uh so you you are like building a, a material database for like different materials like in terms of like lithium-ion batteries like if you if you are trying to like burn a lithium ion battery in, in a in a cone, I don't know how, how that will scale up to like 
the scooters that you're using? Yeah, that's a, very, that's a very good question. So some people in the literature have burned individual cells in the cone. Uh, we're doing some work with looking at the different uh, separator materials, as well as uh, lithium ion battery packing materials to get some ideas how they might be used to kind of limit thermal runaway. Um, so that will be getting added to the database later this year. We're doing that work with another part of our organization that focuses on the battery safety. Uh, so we focus mostly on, all right, it's built, it's out in the world. What do we do with this one as opposed to like individual battery chemistry and things like that? But we do help our partners with that. So yeah, that's uh, we're, we're trying to understand that. How does it scale up? Yes. Um, how are you measuring? If you are you measuring? It sounds like you're measuring HF for like the different battery fires. How how are you actually getting those measurements? Is it like an absorber or like are you sampling or? So we're, we're basically doing time average sampling at the moment, and uh, we've got some stuff in the works that has worked well with uh, HCN uh, with heated lines and uh, drawing it in. We have a, uh, a young lady on our staff right now that is our, our laser jockey, if you will. And so she's been a Shri Ganakar, Dr. Shri Ganakar. And uh, she's been developed, she initially was using the lasers to measure water vapor in fires because there was a misunderstanding that fires are a dry environment when we all know based on the atmosphere, well, <laughs> in some parts of the world, right? Yeah. Not necessarily with fire scientists. And so there's a concern from the firefighters about putting water on the fire while victims might still be in there. So there's no off the shelf way to measure water vapor. Uh, when we're dealing with fire conditions and fire temperatures. So uh, they, she developed a laser system to do that so we could demonstrate how much water vapor is in the air before any water is flown, and, uh, flown from the hoses at all. And, like, don't worry about that. Take the heat off the people that might be there and stop the generation of the hazardous gases. So um, she's now extended that practice to HCN and we're working on, the, on going further. Uh, we have a for you, FTIR, uh, that we're getting to try to use that to look for some of these gases as well. I know um, you could, uh, there's been research in using measuring the FT using the FTIR with the heated line for HCl. And just the issue with this is that if there's PTFE tubing, it's going to absorb onto the footage. Yeah. yeah. There's always there's a lot of challenge. I mean, part of the engineering and part of the research in many cases is just developing the measurement technology needed to get a grasp on this, not just collecting the data itself. So we, we do have a lot of challenges, which is why our, our staff needs to grow. Thank you very much, Dan. Any more questions? And again, thank you all for, for coming. I think there's more pizza out there. We probably over pizza. Um, but uh, this is uh, being recorded. Just to, to reemphasize, so you know, we're, we're, we're sort of partnering with FSRI and, and the Boston Fire Department to do some, uh, some testing. Uh, we're delighted to, to do this in the next week or so, uh, and hopefully that continues on. But, but part of this is also to, to hopefully grow our relationship with FSRI. Um, and so we're offering um, these independent study projects, maybe even a thesis if one wants to do that, uh, if students are interested. So um, FSRI has emerged, I think, I'll say probably is a premier research institution with regards to fire um, uh, in terms of, you know, the funding that they have and the work that they're getting involved with. And so if students want to um, participate in that, uh, this is a great opportunity. Again, these are independent study projects, so you can take this in place of a course, okay? Uh, it can extend, uh, be for one course, it can extend over the summer and count for two courses, so that'd be six credits, okay? Uh, and you can do some really interesting work. Um, part of that would be uh, potentially doing work here, um, learning things about FDS and computer modeling, which they do need a lot of help with, um, and potentially uh, even going down to some of their facilities, um, which would be funded by FSRI uh, if, if students want to do that. So I think it's a great opportunity um, for, uh, for students if they want to get more into sort of research um, and, um, you know, and, and learn about learning about fire, right? And, and how uh, Dan explains to it, or ex tried to explain to us that it's, it's not just about running these tests, it's trying to figure out how to run the test and how to measure things so that we can use that data in some useful way uh, in the future. So anyways, I'll, um, I'll stop there and um, 
thank you all for coming and and uh, and have a great weekend. This, by the way, uh, hopefully will uh, is recorded. Looks like it's uh, it is recording successfully. So I'll make this available. So tell your friends. Okay, thank you. Right, you guys can ask questions now.